All right, I'm just plugging in my phone. Hopefully everyone's having a good time. Cool, I'm ready. I'm going to begin. Uh, welcome to week 11. Whoa, this has gone on so far. It's um, almost drawing to a close for the whole course. Uh, we've got one more week. And I think next week you're delivering your final projects, your major works um, with the Fearful Symmetry. And what I want to talk about today is to sort of start to close this loop around this question of how do you actually make that je ne sais quoi? I've talked a bit about, uh, we've talked about color, we've talked about, um, you know, abstraction, we've talked about randomness, we've talked about various things that can integrate with the P5 library and certain kinds of technical things that you can uh, do to put functions in and We've looked at ways that the art world has sort of tackled similar functions. We've looked at interaction, we've looked at hooking. So we've looked at how you kind of get the machinations of a user and then an interface. And then maybe, how do you say something? Maybe that's about color, maybe that's about um, something else. Maybe uh, you're thinking about how you might put a circle on the internet, but by now you should have some kind of solid way to think about not just the content of what you're doing, but also the sort of shape that it needs to take in order for it to become an artwork. Um, but you might actually also be in this stage where you have made something, but you're pondering that same thing that Orson Welles pondered in a previous lecture. It's pretty, but is it art? And we talked about previously how art actually is not just a painting and it's not just a software thing. It's not just one kind of, it's not just a video game. It's not just a, you know, while we might think of, you know, a sculpture as, you know, sculpture equals art or art equals sculpture. One thing that I've tried to get through from the start is that actually art is the excess sort of thing of something. So a paint, an artwork can be a painting, but, and a painting can be art, but an artwork is not necessarily a painting, and a painting is not necessarily an artwork. So an, art, an artwork can be lots of different things, and a painting can be lots of different things. A painting can be a, a sign on the side of a shop. It can be um, a piece of propaganda. It can, you know, whatever. But it's not necessarily art, and it doesn't have to be art. Just like your P5 sketch, maybe it's at a stage where you're... Um, getting the idea of um, that you've got a, a functional program and that it's pretty and that it's doing something. Maybe it's an ad, you've made ads already in this course. Um, so what's the difference between what you're doing with your major project and what you've done previously? How do you get that thing to elevate to that next level? Uh, and the answer is, and we're gonna talk about that today, the answer is you have to add a little magic. Now. We're in computer science and the question then is, how can we take that seriously? We've got this problem of, um, you know, art is a little wishy-washy enough. We're in a computer science program. Surely we can't be talking about magic. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about magic today in a way that aims to uh, get at both a scientific kind of truth and an artistic truth so that you can actually have a way of thinking about how to create magic in your artwork. Because without the magic, we don't get the art. Uh, and our title for the lecture is Duende. And it, we'll see what a Duende is later, uh, but essentially it's a demon. And we wanna think about how can we load some kind of demonic or even angelic or some kind of like spiritual or supernatural force uh, into our artwork. So the question is, donde esta el duende? Where is your duende? If you're looking at your artwork, this is, this is something I actually am borrowing from a colleague of mine at Victoria College of the Arts, who um, 
Mark Dustin was the head of print media and drawing. We were on a residency together at Megalo last year. And he said that he asked his students, where is the duende? And so I went looking uh, about definitions of duende and found that there were a lot of parallels between this concept of duende, which is a Spanish uh, concept of, um, and, and relates to a, a kind of tradition of sort of demons in, in the Spanish history. But it also ties really interestingly to pretty much all conception of that, that sort of supernatural force of art that has pervaded um, Western art generally. So let's have a look. Where is the duende? This is, we've looked at Jordan Wolfson's female figure. And, um, and a duende is essentially a hobgoblin. Uh, so they're a mischievous kind of um, creature that basically causes problems, uh, but also in in doing so, they're quite trickstery and they're quite exciting. And I thought this figure was something that um, the female figure of Jordan Wilson was a really great sort of icon. We've looked at it previously um, in relation to uh, uh, when we looked at Jordan Wilson, um, and essentially. The idea is that the duende will possess the uh, the artwork or the dancer, and um, there's a reading, a sort of you know recommended reading, or there's just a PDF at the end of the slides, uh, which is Garcia Lorca's um, treatise on duende uh, for theatre and performance, and um, basically the premise is that when as a performer can make something absolutely perfect, they actually need something that's a greater ingredient. Because when you make something that you think is perfect, like if you've sort of mastered the art and mastered the craft, you need to have done so in such a way that you don't have to rely on the mastery because you might actually screw up the technicality. And if you stuff up technically in a performance, you can make up for that, but actually you can go even higher at a higher level by sort of being becoming possessed by Duende. And he writes about um, a singer in, this is Garcia Lorca writing in the 1920s, and he writes about a singer who knew that she was about to be judged by a panel of very expert singers and knew that she couldn't rely on her expertise alone because it would it wasn't quite as strong as the other experts in the judging panel. So she knew that she had to rely on Duende. So it's sort of a fiery hobgoblin force and she needed to sort of muster up this demonic um, this demonic aspect to carry us further and get us beyond the sort of expert or virtuosic performance. We needed she needed to elevate it, uh, give it a whole lot of attitude. So think rock and roll. Think, um, you know, the most whatever you think is the most like sublime rock and roll star. In the performance, they they're giving it all, but they're not relying. If you've ever been to a live show, it's never as technically slick as the album is. The album's pretty much like produced really, um, you know, by experts, and it's post-produced and it's really slick. But then on the stage, it's raw. And so to combat that rawness, they have to bring a certain kind of energy, a certain kind of chutzpah, a certain kind of je ne sais quoi. They need to get possessed by the duende. So I guess that's the overarching question for today's lecture. Where is the duende? And um, some of these other terms, with, uh, you know, alongside duende, but in different kinds of cultures, they basically mean that art is magic. And... Some words that we have used include sublime, right? So the idea that, wow, an artwork is sublime, it sort of elevates. We talked about a little bit about pseudo longinus and his idea of sublime being an elevation where something is so perfect that it exceeds the thing that it is and, we, and the audience is in a state of ecstasy. Um, then there's the, also the romantic sublime, which is that something is so beautiful that it's terrifyingly beautiful. Um, then we also have in um yeah ben's writing that term chutzpah chutzpah is uh very important i think it's a yiddish term it basically refers to um someone who's got a lot of attitude someone who 
people would often talk about Donald Trump as having a lot of chutzpah, like a lot of nerve um, to sort of bring that. Uh, and, it, and it has a strong impact that moves people. A lot of people who have been moved politically get moved by, the, by chutzpah. Another thing that people get moved by is this term sprezzatura. Sprezzatura is basically that feeling when uh, you've seen someone just wake up and they look like a million dollars. Or if you've ever seen that really like stylish person that looks like they've put no effort into being stylish. Uh, they've maybe got bed hair and they're just like, you know, kind of, they, they have a look, they look like they just woke up out of a cave. But for some reason, they're the most stylish and coolest looking person around. Uh, so sprezzatura is a term that describes that. It's an Italian word. Talk a bit about that. Uh, in Chinese cultures and Chinese philosophies, philosophies and philosophies that um, have been built on upon that, um, there's the concept of qi, and qi is this like state of grace in which uh, the the way of things is represented through a sort of breath of energy, and the art that is made or people that are in tune with that qi move as a, at a sort of graceful um, meandering through life that is kind of effortless. Uh, so it's an effortless grace that is in tune with the universe that then gives the audience a sort of uh, transcendent, um, tranquil and um, exciting uh, sort of injection of, of, of life. Um, and then there is charisma. So particularly in uh, Western culture, the idea of charisma basically means that someone with charisma is someone that has been touched by the heavens someone that is basically connected to god or whatever god-like thing you believe in and that they're sort of speaking from from that position and sometimes when we look at a work of art we get a sense that it has charisma that it's it's kind of got this aspect that there you can't quite put your finger on it but it's really just kind of shining down at you um another term another related term that could be added to this list is aura so something seems like it has a special mag magical significance. Uh, and there's a really famous writer called Walter Benjamin who wrote a lot about the aura of art, um, which is that when an artwork f has a ritual function, uh, when we kind of use an artwork for some kind of magical ritual, like religious or superstitious or whatever, that that thing is actually a, um, a ritual object and it has an aura to it. And then when we, when we reproduce when we make reproductions of that, the aura gets lost because it's, you know, it's got to come from that initial uh, ritual object thing. Uh, there's duende. So duende has, has a lot of what those other things have, including, and might be closer to sprezzatura or chutzpah, in which we've got this, or, and even attaches to the sublime, but there's this sort of mischievous mischievous trolling going on in, in the supernatural spheres that has been injected into the artwork. And if you're a fan of music, you might have heard groove or soul. When something has groove or it has soul, like it's sort of communicating from like another plane of, um, of experience. Uh, so if it's got groove, maybe, it, maybe it, you become possessed as you listen to it and you start moving and dancing in a certain way and you sort of just can't help yourself. And when something has soul, Maybe a move to tears. Um, so this is a, a powerful one in the uh, production of um, soul music in particular, disco funk, uh, jazz, blues, um, and rock and roll. So I've just added, in addition to these terms, there's a, um, there's a series of m metaphors. Last week we talked about metaphors. And so I'm going to extend the metaphor of the metaphor as the magic of art, uh, if, if you'll allow me, to kind of think about that idea of those metaphors that create interference patterns where we sort of see this overarching structure. Um, we see the qualities of one thing on top of another. That is kind of what is happening with uh, these terms and, and how these terms describe it. So we get a, a big sense of what a cultural uh, sort of network of ideas you know what different cultures have valued as the ritual function of art or the ritual function of some artworks right so uh, 
let's look at Duende. The performer is a demon. So the human person is, becomes equivalent with demon. Uh, in groove or soul, expression is truth. Okay, so even though we know that those two terms aren't exactly the same, we know that um, there is something that overlaps and is shared with them that then allows this to be a metaphorical sort of uh, concept that allows us to filter uh, the qualities of one over, over onto the qualities of another. So that is in Sublime, beauty is terror, spreads to her, mastery is nonchalant. Um, that is uh, someone who's a technical virtuoso doesn't actually have to try very hard to impress anybody. They can just sort of like, you know, draw a little scribble and it all looks good. And um, in Qi, breath is a cosmological flow. Wu Wei comes from um, the traditions of Confucianism and, and Taoism. And it's just this idea that action good action is effortless. So that's the ideal to aspire to. So some of these relate, like Sprezzatura relates nicely to Wu Wei uh, in terms of effortlessness and nonchalantness. Charisma relates in a weird inverse relation to Duende where a human is God, in Duende performer is a demon, um, etc. But basically each of these terms describe the feeling that an artwork is greater than the sum of its parts. So that's what we're looking for when we're looking for an artwork. So I love the metaphor of the interference pattern for this. I think it is a really clear illustration of what we're looking for. In This is a, a moiré pattern, and in an interference pattern, what we're talking about is we're talking about when you have two things that overlap each other, and then an interference pattern is that thing where you see something that isn't actually there, but is basically an effect of the things that were in place, right? So an interference pattern is used in terms of waves. And so if we think about these, um, these ripples, these shapes, these concentric circles as ripples, we have two sets of concentric circles. And when they overlap, they produce these extraordinary sort of radiations. And so, you know, they create strange looking spirals that spiral around as if sort of the seed pods of a growth of plants. Um, perhaps they follow the Fibonacci sequence. Um, I haven't modeled that. But then we, towards the left and right sides, we get these really thicker, increasingly thick bands of lines. And those lines don't actually exist. They're implied. They're sort of an illusion that's created through the filtration of one thing over another. Um, so let's have a look at a couple of moiré patterns because I think they're going to help us get to where we need to go. Um, so we have a s smaller circular moiré going over. Hopefully you can see this now that I've full screened it. Give me a heads up if you, if you can't see this. But what we get is a whole range of different effects that happen as this moves over. So this one grating of concentric circles is producing a variety of different kinds of effects and chromatic relations despite the, um, the lack of that, its existence. Could you guys see that okay? Maybe let me know, otherwise I, maybe I won't. Um, so that's with the, those moires. Then what happens um, if we look at one where we basically have some vertical bands overlapping some triangular forms. They create these movements. In, on the right-hand side, we see these sort of barber pole lines radiating up and down. And then we also have these, uh, this illusion of a... Um, uh, these sort of honeycomb structures just moving to, towards the right. So we get this uh, intense sense of movement that actually isn't happening. We've just got one thing moving across another thing, but the uh, visual effect of this is substantially um, greater than the sum of the two parts. In fact, it's created by the interactions between those. Um, 
And let's go even more complicated and we'll look at, uh, thanks Ryan for the, for the heads up. So I think this works. Um, we now have a square grating and then we have coming down some horizontal bands which produce a, an intense kind of optical effect of this um, sort of shaking of an hourglass figure by virtue of the fact that uh, of the overarching form of the lower layer and then the upper layer and then how those two things vibrate against each other. And that's, I think, a really close metaphor for thinking about what is this magic? This magic is a kind of um, weird interference pattern that is giving us um, the sort of dazzling effect. And they can be used to like just dazzle us sensorially but they can also be used to create a thing in which um, we see a weird implied movement that isn't there that then we can use to uh, create all kinds of different pictorial transformations up and down. So uh, this is a, a fluid moiré pattern by bite size coding. Uh, and what we'll see is just the effect of uh, circular repeat rings that then combine with just vertical bands and how just those two arrangements of shapes produce uh, a, the downward movement of a series of what look like organ pipes or pan flute um, moments. Okay, so this is not to say that interference patterns are visually superior to any other form of art. It's really just to say that, um, it's really just to say that if we think about the interference pattern as a metaphor, what we're trying to get from a work of art is that we have set up some kinds of parameters, uh, some kinds of structures there in the work. And then when we set up another structure, that what it does is it vibrates against the other structure and creates a really compelling kind of idea. So it's almost like the idea of the metaphor that we looked at last week, where we set up one metaphor. Maybe that metaphor is, um, in this instance, the metaphor is horizontality, um, no, verticality, and the other metaphor is squareality. And then when we overlay those two on top of each other, they produce a really strange effect. Um, so that's basically what these magical concepts are going to do. They're going to say, okay, what is, the, what is the concept of that magical condition that is sprezzatura? Well, it's mastery plus nonchalance. So those two things will create a psychological effect in the viewer where we will sort of understand this weird metaphor, that understand the presence of a metaphor. Um, we may not necessarily need to be, may not necessarily be able to identify it, but we'll feel the presence of it and that will compel us to keep looking and keep um, understanding. And because we can't necessarily read it completely, uh, that's what makes us feel like there's something special and magical about this object. Okay, so let's get a little like more pragmatic then. How can magic occur in your uh, major work? So you're dealing with um, fearful symmetry and we've used the moiré pattern which has a geometric sort of uh, element to it. And so let's look at this concept of the game of life. I have a feeling Charles might have or might introduce this, might have already or might introduce this next week. But the game of life is essentially, uh, it's what's called cellular automata, which is a kind of form of simulated life um, where, some, where something happens in and because of itself. It's not necessarily programmed to happen. Um, here we get a word from... Yeah, cool, did some Game of Life this week. So you know a little bit about the Game of Life. So I, actually, I don't need to introduce it too much. Um, but what I can do is, just just in case anyone didn't see Charles's thing, uh, it's a series of, it's a grid with a series of on-off dots uh, that obey a set of rules, and those rules then tell the dot whether to turn on or off. And if the rules are structured in a certain way, such as they are with the game of life, what we start to see is the interaction of the uh, on and off grids create uh, sort of automata, 
where we get little, almost like life forms that emerge out of uh, the cellular automata. And then it creates this system that looks a lot like um, how we consider life. Um, so, so it's alive. So let me, I'll just refresh this page and we'll get a sense of a processing implementation of the game of life. And what we'll get is a whole lot of patterns that look diagrammatically like they're sort of uh, rotating or, or shifting. And then we've got all these other kind of noisy patterns. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna kind of eat each other and then they're going to um, also uh, cr create sort of strange moving things called gliders. But if we look here, I'll zoom in. If we look in, we've got these, we've got a few kind of examples of these things that are basically just horizontal and vertical things. And they're like switches and they're just switching on and off. And, um, and then we've got these other uh, kind of more random things that seem to be just rotating out and around and once they collide with some of those things that are just doing that they're going to change the behavior of these things they might actually erase and kill the things or they might actually um, combine with it and produce a new kind of pattern that will just uh, continue to emerge so towards the left i've just seen one of these uh, fall apart and i'm about to see another one down the bottom fall apart i think just by combination with another one and so in that kind of combination, they're sort of generating a whole new sort of rhythm of, um, of how this is uh, sort of coming together. Uh, and so this is always different whenever I refresh. If I refreshed again, I'm actually waiting to see if it runs out of steam. Sometimes, it, usually it does. Um, and sometimes we see little things that sort of hover around uh, these things that are called gliders or sometimes spaceships in the game of life that hover around. Um, and sometimes it can fizzle out really quickly and sometimes it can fizzle out uh, far, a long time away. Um, but because of the rules of the game of life, often what appears on this screen is, you know, is quite consistent. These rules have set up um, or make possible a certain type of variety of quote unquote living things, um, which means that uh, we can imagine that actually, and, and we will look at the rules, the rules aren't telling these things to do what they're doing um, in terms of how they appear. They're not saying create a horizontal band and vertical band that goes like this and this. But what they are doing is they're saying turn off if, turn on if, and then because of the neighbors and the neighbor relations, um, then they uh, explain that a little bit. So actually what I'll do is I'll just keep that going a little bit. And so this was developed by John Conway and basically the a cell one of those squares in the grid is either on or off based on these rules any it, the initial conditions are randomly um, you know a random amount are alive and, and not alive and then every frame is a new generation um, that that changes according to these rules or stays the same according to these rules but it checks these rules for advice on its further behavior any live cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies as if by underpopulation. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors lives on to the next generation. And any live cell with more than three live neighbors dies as if by overpopulation. And any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell as if by reproduction. And so this is how we then get this uh, constantly changing uh, representation. And this theoretically could go on forever if uh, there was um, enough, uh, if there were enough sort of um, dots in place to start with in the right kind of arrangement, this could actually just uh, live on forever. Cool. Initial density settings, thank you. Um, oh, cool. So Charles has put a link up to his game of life implementation. Let's have a little squiz while we're here. This is possibly the most interesting game of life implementation I've seen in P5. All the ones that I've seen start quickly and then fizzle out within, within 
like 10, 20 seconds. Cool. We're going to check back up on that and see how that's going. This one's almost fizzled out now. Um, I might actually just close this one just because it's playing hell with my RAM. Um, but in that, uh, within those rules, what can happen is if you set up this, a certain kind of um, arrangement of uh, live things from the first get-go, you can create these kinds of gliders, uh, which um, are, uh, it, it's just a pattern that, that comes out of those initial, uh, of that initial initialization. Um, and the initial pattern is actually just the sort of like top structure and these things just bounce to and fro and then they produce these small little sort of spaceshipy looking things that crawl around uh, the, the grid. And um, what's really interesting about this is that from, you know, none of this has been programmed, none of it is even um, conceivable within the code, but what is conceivable is when, when you operate it and you see how the thing behaves, it has these what are called emergent properties whereby if you create, if you tell it to do something within that overarching ecology, it will behave in a certain way that then you can sort of cultivate and shape to then make these ongoing uh, properties. So this then is called uh, the Bill Gosper's glider gun, where uh, it produces these things and shoots li little gliders out. Uh, and you can imagine if you set up the game of life with a certain kind of arrangement, you could have these glider guns constantly producing new live cells as if by reproduction, um, uh, that then we could, you could aim them at each other and then produce new kinds of forms. So this could be a sort of engine of, um, of life-giving stuff. Charles is, man, Charles is still going. This is great. Yeah, so they're, they're supposed to fizzle out, but I prefer it if they don't fizzle out. Um, anyway, there's... So here's an example of Gosper's Gladys gun. The only reason I'm bringing this to Wikipedia, I know this is a university, but because they have all these like great animated GIFs of various properties of it, I'm not sure if Charles went through it. Um, but from those rules, those basic rules of if this, then it, it should live, if this, then it should die, um, if this, then it should spark progeny, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there are these arrangements of things like a block and a beehive and a, and a loaf, a boat, a tub that are still lives. And then these oscillators, these things that are like vertical and then horizontal. And then um, we have spaceships such as gliders, lightweight spaceships, middleweight spaceships, heavyweight spaceships, and the spaceships move. So still lives and then the oscillators, the oscillators stay in place and they sort of change pattern, sort of sparkle in that nice way and then spaceships move around. And so it's with these sort of uh, three different types of things that uh, really unpredictable results can come out of um, the game of life. And the game of life has been an inspiration for lots of artists in code to make generative, um, generative art, generative music. When um, we talked a little bit about Brian Eno a couple of weeks back, uh, but when Brian Eno first saw the game of life, that's when he stopped making recorded music and just started committing himself to rules-based generative um, music. So this is the initial condition of the glider gun. So if you basically can, if you program it so that if you click on a square and it makes it alive, you could, you could draw this in the, in your own version of a game of life. And then when you press play, this would just start um, producing uh, the gliders gun. Then there's other glider guns that you can uh, develop to produce. Now, why does this make any, um, what does this have to do with your work of art? Well, essentially it's um, setting up the terms upon which you create something that is greater than any is greater than what went into it, and um, we talk a lot about um, you know people are more than just the sum of their parts, or groups are more than just the sum of their parts, uh, rock bands are more than just the sum of their parts. That you you kind of need the glue of each thing and the way that they interact with each other to get the magic that they bring, and that's true of any work of art that you uh, try and make. So um, make your own version of the game of life. Charles has made his, and his is remarkably different to uh, any of the others, but already we just saw a uh, still life getting eaten 
uh, but it seems to keep coming back in some sort of appearance. Um, so that's really interesting. I wonder if we've just got this huge meta non-moving um, oscillator that's just incredibly complicated. I'm just going to do one more thing and just play it again. Come back to it. Um, so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about emergent properties. And these are the things that help our metaphors and our interference patterns and things happen. It's when interactions between component parts produce higher order effects. And it's the higher order effects that are of aesthetic interest in that sort of magical sense. So that's why I feel buoyed to use the term magical because there is a scientific sort of explanation for this kind of magic where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And um, so far we've talked about uh, how this works uh, without mentioning it. We've talked about the metaphor where beauty plus terror and then you combine those two things in a synthesis that then leads to um, this painting in which you simultaneously can appreciate uh, the beauty of the composition of the framing of the painting. You can view the beauty of the natural landscape, but then at the same time you can view the sort of magnitude of the nature with respect to the uh, person facing us and the precarity of that person. And so all of these different elements of what makes, of what you can notice in this painting is what makes this thing, um, is what makes this painting have an effect. So if we're talking about an artwork having an effect, we're kind of thinking about it as if, um, even at the level of a painting, we're sort of thinking about it at the level that it's, you know, some kind of a machine where it sort of emanates effects. And that's why we love art, or that's why people who love art love art, because art does something, it moves us, it has an effect on us. And it does that by, these, by having properties that um, create higher order effects when, in, when they combine and interact with each other. And it's not something you can necessarily do by design. In fact, the, the best thing that you can do is really just set up a set of initial conditions and see if that produces any kinds of effects. So um, let's look at a couple other examples. Oh, actually, I'll just finish that point. So uh, if we're gonna look at the effects of um, uh, this kind of painting, or let's talk about your programs, you might be working with certain kinds of functions that are doing a thing. But then if you think about well, what happens when you make one function talk to another function, or you know, if you think about one of your functions maybe as one of the glider guns from before, what happens if you aim one of these glider guns at another glider gun? Uh, and can that produce even higher order effects? So we can have like a, a thing that with another thing produces a higher order effect. And then we can have another thing with another thing that produces a higher order effect. And we've got these two higher order effect things with component parts. What if they um, combine or interact together to produce another higher order effect? How, how many higher orders can we get um, to create a sort of compelling, mysterious um, thing that is emanating uh, at a much greater value than the sum of its parts. Um, I won't actually show this video, you can look at it on your own, but um, I'll show another video of this artist's work because that's going to, um, so it just takes me a sec to load it up um, because it looks better if I do it from whatever I ripped from Vimeo. Um, so this is uh, Ryoji Ikeda. Uh, he is a Japanese artist who um, was, uh, he had an exhibition at Carriage Works in Sydney, uh, but he's really interested in the idea of um, playing with code, playing with video, playing with audio, um, playing with data and noise and all kinds of different ways and then just seeing what happens when they combine and filter over each other um, and then how he can then build on that in a sort of intuitive construction after really observing the properties and effects that they have. So let's just have a look at um, Ryoji Ikeda. Just give me a heads up if the sound isn't working.
having just looked at that, I do apologize for not warning anyone that may have seen some flashing lights. Um, hope that was okay. Um, feel free to let us know how you how you're going with that. Um, ooh, sometimes Charles has seen a spinner not work, which suggests that he has the rules wrong somehow. Yeah, I mean, yeah, story of story of an artist's life doing things wrong. All right, so let's have a look at a couple of examples of uh, these sort of magical effects. Um, one is the idea of sp sprezzatura. Um, uh, basically, in sprezzatura, we're looking at this idea of mastery is nonchalance. So it translates, it's an Italian word that literally translates to a lively nonchalance. And um, it comes out of like sort of courtly behavior of someone who doesn't try very hard because they're so um, because they're so skilled, they try and hide how skilled they are as a form of generosity to uh, the person that they're talking to or the viewer or whatever. And so, um, Anthony Van Dyke is an example of someone who often is referred to uh, or, or has been referred to by Deanna Petherbridge and um, uh, others as as an artist that has sprezzatura in their drawing. Uh, and what that means is that like everyone knows that Anthony Van Dyke is a killer artist. Um, he's one of the great masters. When you look at his sketches, which are sometimes called cartoons, they're sort of him uh, trying to find an idea for his, um, what kind of painting he's gonna make. If we think about sort of the mastery of some of the other artists, like um, other masters of his era, they're very sort of very mapped out really sort of like tight works that are you know rent everything's rendered to the t even in the drawing phase but anthony van dyke has these just sort of wispy um expressions of a feature of the horse so if you look at uh the horse's front right foot um you kind of actually just get a couple of wiggles and that conveys to us uh hoarseness uh, and if we look at the um man or woman I guess I think it looks manly to me um, standing next to the horse not on the horse but standing next to it it's just a few little lines that have been confidently um, uh, expressed onto the um, onto the figure and we read it as a figure but we don't read it as someone showing off for their ability to render the perfect figure as we um, have seen in in lots of works from this period of time so there's a sort of a economy of this that the artist is using where they're not trying to they're not sort of worried that someone's going to see their little scribbles and think that they are a preschool painter um, they're confident enough that this expresses and engages the idea that they're going for um, without necessarily having to be intimidatingly um, you know precise Frank Gehry is a, a architect who's um, drawing style has captured a lot of imagination particularly in the architectural community in which he uh, this is a design for a building it's a sketch for a design for a building so when coming up with an idea someone's talking to him want to make this kind of building and then he scribbles this thing it kind of looks like Donald Trump's signature it kind of looks like um, just a Cy Twombly scribble uh, that may not mean much to you if you don't know Cy Twombly but um, it looks like a, just an abstract squiggle. And Frank Gehry is a trained architect. He can draw technically. He knows how to do all of the very precise things. Uh, in fact, you can't be an architect without knowing how to do that. Um, but at the same time, he's aware of the power of the line and the nonchalant line to persuade someone to give him money to build a building. Uh, so much so that uh, that sketch is for this uh, Fonda Fondation Louis Vuitton in Paris, which looks much more stable than his drawing does, but at the same time conveys the kind of movement of the building. Um, and this is where we might see um, the sort of solidness or finish as something as dynamic or fluid. Uh, and that's part of that metaphor of, of sprezzatura. So in Qi, the idea is usually that um, there is a flow of energy through the work and that an artist uh, in, in the form of painting 
an artist is acting in such a way that they have their chi in place and that when they paint they are expressing breath and there are sort of perfect brush strokes and the sort of less effort and labor that goes into the brush stroke the more centered the breath and the chi was to create the kind of balance um, so while this may not be as detailed as a um, western photorealist painting or even a renaissance optically constructed thing not the whole paper isn't covered you know there's sort of vacuous spaces that aren't expressed um, and that's part of um, allowing for breath within the work um, against so so a lack of detail can equate equivalent to giving breath and allowing the viewer to breathe uh, and so there's a sort of visual breath but then there's also this um, concept that uh, in the lack of detail what is preferred to the optical detail is the feeling of movement and breath expressed through a uh, brushstroke made by a master who has mastered their chi. Um, Roman Verotsko was uh, an artist who used this myth of the calligraphic brush mark as a form of chi or breath um, in his algorithmic paintings and drawings where he had um, a plotter which is like an olden day printer that has like an arm on it, um, robotic arm with a drawing implement in it, usually a felt tip pen in the old days, and then the um, plotter would tell it what X, Y position to draw upon. Um, and with, uh, with the plotter, you could interchange the, um, the felt tip pen, which is a very binary pen. It's either all the way on or all the way off in a neat line. Um, and you could change that for a brush, or you could change it for any kind of drawing tool. And Roma Barotsko was really interested in um, giving that sort of digital mechanical precision of and mathematical sort of building up of, of a plotter, giving it a sort of brush mark that creates a breathly um, sort of creates a myth within us that the computer has actually mastered the art of chi and, and breath. And um, you know that it's not just about uh, Western ideals of um, brushwork, but also, you know, very uh, knowingly, Roman Verotsko has placed a um, calligraphic looking red square stamp characteristic of, you know, Chinese painting in the right almost upper corner. And these sort of like vertical calligraphic marks uh, that the plotter has used in the felt tip pen. Uh, but then overlay these uh, various brush marks in an algorithmic form. Now, I didn't make up the duende. Duende have been known about for uh, centuries in Spanish folklore. And um, it's in the duende that uh, Francisco Goya considered the ugliness of um, how, how we went insane and mad. Uh, and by we, I mean um, the sort of Christian history of um, Western culture went crazy in the Spanish Inquisition and the torturing of loads of people and the murders and the um, everything in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and Francisco Goya painted the Duendecidos, which are the hobgoblins, which, you know, gives some credence to the idea that, that the Duende is actually a culturally important idea and that they get up to mischief, horror, and this sort of supernatural madness that they can um, create in humanity. In fact, in... Um, Francisco Goya's etchings, uh, the, um, he made a lot of etchings about the uh, horrors of war brought about by the Spanish Inquisition, um, uh, which were um, really graphic, horrifying images where he has sort of amplified the, um, the realism. He's, he's sort of, or well, I should say, he sort of sidestepped the realism in an optical sense and gone for a more expressionistic realism, uh, and in this case, uh, rendering things as hobgoblins, as duendes, or in this case, duendecitos. Um, I thought this was a good video to show with respect to uh, duende. This is uh, Sachiko Kodama's um, ferro, uh, ferro fluid sculptures. And what they are is um, these kind of forms where there is ferrofluid which is a which is a fluid filled with metal particles that have a um, magnetic 
uh, resonance to them. And so if you change the magnetic frequency um, underneath them, they start to behave in quite possessed looking ways. So um, let's have a look at this one um, it, and have a think about what that looks like, what that sort of um, possessed feel looks like in this video. So that was, um, so Shichika Kodama is a Japanese artist and using her ferrofluid, it looks quite um, computer generated, but actually it's just a, ro a mechanical sculpture rotating and then uh, the, mag the magnetism of that object and the pulse that runs through it makes this material behave in a really strange way, um, creating peaks in these sort of horned forms and sort of there's something about the blackness of the material as well that really, um, you know, it, it sort of hides light, but it's also ultra shiny. It's sort of like a black hole, but it also has spikes. So it's sort of like this black hole of a life form. Um, so it's really got quite a poetic tendency. Now to move us on to the last one, um, I'll be talking about the idea of can a robot make art next week. Um, in, this, in this instance, we're uh, looking at the idea of something being possessed, something being possessed into some kind of like meaningful emergent life. And Daft Punk are a rock, well, they're a techno band that have um, used as their marketing proposition the idea that they are a party, they are party robots. And ever since the um, emergence of Y2K and that mythology, um, this idea of something being infected by a thing was seen as this sort of liber liberatory uh, thing and a marketing opportunity for Daft Punk to uh, market themselves to the masses and, you know, become quite a household pop um, thing. What's interesting about them is they take within that rhetoric is this position that, okay, if you have this machine that does this thing repetitively as techno music reliably does, it's techno music and electronic dance is frequently denounced as being repetitive in its repetition, what what they do is they take samples that, and they repeat those samples and then they layer those samples on top of each other and that creates a form of groove and they collaborate with a lot of um, musicians to get to that point and groove I, I just think is the, the perfect um, analogy to this idea of the um, interference pattern. The way that groove works is that if you have um, a if you have a form of um, music. Charles will talk about this heaps better than me, so Charles, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, groove, kind of, as my understanding is, is if there's a beat, if there's a rhythm, um, what happens is that interacts with the other rhythm, and that, that rhythm might be vocal, it might be from the guitar, it might be from the drums or whatever, but as they start to overlay, what they do is there are gaps between the beats that become really complicated patterns. And that's what the brain starts to latch onto is the negative space of the gap. So a sort of anti-gap. And it's that anti-gap that 
uh, gets the brain thinking about, okay, where is that gap? And it usually sits somewhere between the beats. And so then it, the act of sort of being moved to dance is sometimes that, um, that feeling of trying to find that beat or catch that beat in some intersensory mode, how to, how to sort of feel that beat, even though you can't hear it, um, which is why probably rock music has often been accused of like turning teenagers into Satanists and um, possessing, you know, making people look possessed because they start moving in unpredictable ways. So I think that's a really great metaphor. Aretha Franklin is the, um, you know, kind of archetypal soul musician um, is, is uh, someone to really look to. There is a recent documentary or a, it's just a live performance from the 1970s of, um, it's called Amazing Grace and it's Aretha Franklin just singing in front of a church and you see the effect of the groove of her music and the soul of her music that I think is a really great um, filmographic visualization of people just being moved beyond, um, uh, beyond just what they're hearing. Uh, this is not from that documentary. This is from the very uh, well-renowned uh, Blues Brothers directed by John Landis from 1980. Uh, also a great film about uh, blues, soul and groove. Um, we've hit 356, uh, so the only thing I wanted to kind of add to this idea of soul is that soul is really this idea that expression equals truth. And um, unfortunately, as of last night, the website seems to be down, but Oliver Eliasson and Ai Weiwei produced a, um, this website. I'll just skip to it so you can watch it when you're ready. But basically, it's a website interface where they've created a huge high-res moon and people can go into that moon and they can draw on that moon and scroll around it. Um, and it's sort of looking at the importance of being able to communicate our feelings and our like hearts to each other across the globe. And it's a collaboration between an artist, Oliver Eliasson, who's based in Berlin, uh, who's free to move in the Western world, and the artist Ai Weiwei, who's uh, based in Beijing, um, who is not free to move. His passport has been withheld from the um, government. Um, now we all probably feel like we're in a similar sort of situation, uh, at least in terms of mobility and um, how this sort of global communication is, is becoming a really important and integral part of our experience of each other and life, and blah, blah, blah. So art does these things. Art, um, even, uh, even if you can't see it in your work net now, what I'd love you to take away from this is that if you look at your works really critically, look at all the things that your works do and, and are capable of, and then start to try and, try and see if you can twist them into things that produce these strange and unique interference patterns or, um, or emergent properties. Um, and I definitely recommend you read Garcia Lorca's uh, Theory and Play of the Duende. Uh, and there's another video there uh, of Ricardo Carioba um, building on that idea that um, Ryoji Ikeda uh, was playing with in terms of not necessarily knowing what you're going to do from the from the outset but playing around and seeing what what gets created from various different behaviors and then what happens when you combine those things together um, just going to jump into the chat Crowded cells not die when they should, e.g. four or five neighbors. Ooh, interesting. Game of life issues. Nice. I'm going to keep checking out that game of life. It's good fun. Um, thanks for uh, posting Charles's version. I hope you all got to make a version of it yourselves. And, um, you, you know, there's so many ways to turn that into your own. And um, it's a really great basis point for thinking about how to create emergent generative um, artworks. I'll be pre-recording the... Um, next lecture hoping to have it up online for you on monday so that you have as much time as possible to sort of deal with the kind of concepts and ideas that come up with it and then um, can use it uh, on, on the sort of home stretch for your major works thanks for everyone that um, had some input into the lecture today always appreciate and love seeing what you uh, get interested in thanks very much until next week